Thanks for tuning in to another week's episode of the Trail Talk High Pointing Podcast. One year ago today, the first episode of the 50 States High Pointing Podcast was released on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. And in one year, there have been 47 episodes, 4,600 views on YouTube, 3,865 downloads on audio podcasts from eight different countries, a new name, a new logo, and the podcast is now available on every major platform. I'm grateful to every guest who has given their time to be a part of the show and to share their unique high-pointing story. Without the guests, there would be no show. I would also like to thank everyone who has listened and shared the podcast with others. Your support means a lot. I look forward to another year of high-pointing, storytelling, and enjoying the outdoors with all of you. Thanks for listening and enjoy this week's episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Trail Talk High Pointing Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren, and the High Point we're speaking with today is Kristen Zudak from Texas. Kristen, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So can you tell the listeners a little bit about how you got started in the outdoors and what led you to High Pointing? Well, I can kind of thank my husband for really getting me started in the outdoors, kind of in my adult life. Um, I did a lot of camping and hiking when I was a child and kind of got away from that um, in my teens and 20s. But uh, when I met him, he was an avid long distance runner. And so we would be kind of hanging out and he'd say, I got to go for a run. I'm training for a half marathon. And I started to think there's got to be a better way to enjoy this time together than me just sitting around waiting for him to finish his run. And so I started going on runs with him and kind of realized I, I kind of like running, which I had never done before in my life. And, uh, started running a lot of trails, started doing a lot of races together. And, uh, that was kind of how I primarily enjoyed the outdoors for a good day, probably decade and a half until my knee started to give me trouble. And, uh, Mm -hmm. went and saw some specialists and they said, you know, you probably should give running a break, but you know what you can do? You can hike. (laughs) And so I kind of, started searching out all the trails that were near me and just told myself like, you know, I'm going to hike these as fast as I can. (laughs) And I'm going to, uh, instead of running, that's just what I'm going to do. And so I started just hiking as much as I could. And, uh, that just kind of led me to looking at what are some really good trails in Texas and started kind of just exploring the trails in my own state. And, uh, Ultimately, that led me to just my first high point was the state high point of Texas, which was Guadalupe Peak and um, didn't oh. didn't initially hike it to hike it as a state high point. Didn't even really know that's what it was. Just knew that it was a really cool trail. And uh, once I hiked and realized, hey, this is the highest point in Texas. This is pretty cool. Started just, you know, researching some other state high points and it kind of just took off from there. Yeah, that's cool. I find that that story is common in a lot of high pointers. They're like accidental at first yeah. where they go on a hike and they see the geo survey marker and they're like, Oh, well, this is the highest point in the state. I wonder what I can do next. Yes. Um, so how are the trails around where you are in Texas and where exactly in Texas are you? So I'm in Weatherford, which is about 30 minutes West of Fort Worth and Dallas. Um, you know, it's not a, there's obviously not a lot of elevation gain or anything like that here in North Texas, but I have found a couple of really good, uh, like multi-use trails. So I find that, yeah. I find that where the mountain mm-hmm. bikers go, that's actually where the good trails are as far as, you know, if you want a little bit of elevation gain and some up and down and, and so that's kind of where I tend to do a lot of my local hiking, but um, I've, you know, kind of done a lot of trips outside of Weatherford to state parks. Uh, I love West Texas. I've got family there. And uh, so I go there and hike a lot. And we've done, you know, both of the national parks. And so you have to travel a little further, but that's kind of part of the the positives to living in Texas is it gives you an excuse to travel for some of the really cool trails. And so I've kind of, that's, I don't mind it, I guess. (laughs) And I've heard that Texas has really come a long way in their mountain biking trails and it's now this destination Mm -hmm. for bikers and i also i like 
I like that you're exploring the old backyard adventure. I've been trying to do that <laughs> where I am in North Carolina as well, because my husband and I moved from Arizona last summer. And mm. of course, in Arizona, I just I had a playground there. And sure. then when I came back out here, because I used to live in North Carolina before, I was like, oh, you know, I'm just, I feel like I'm stepping down in terms of hikes. And then I really had to look. And I, you know, I realized we live around some cool state parks and other protected lands, and there's a lot to do, but you have to look for it. It's not going to jump mm -hmm. out at you. And so I, I call it the backyard adventure. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in 2024 is just really explore those because we all have them. You know, we can't do a state high point every weekend. So you got to find yes. something local, you know? Yes, exactly. So after Guadalupe Peak, what was your next high point? Uh, I just headed west, actually. I did uh, Wheeler Peak next, and then it was uh, Humphreys in Arizona, and then it was Kings Peak in Utah. So I kind of just did the the southwest road trip <laughs> right off the bat. That's awesome. I love Wheeler Peak. That was one of my favorite mm -hmm. high points, just because I thought Taos was so beautiful. Yes. Yeah, Wheeler Peak is still probably one of my favorites. That uh, that. I haven't had a chance to go back to it, but it's it's one of the ones I would like to go back to soon. So uh, that whole Southwest mm -hmm. row there is just really, really fun. It is. You're right. Very scenic. Now, do you plan on doing all 50? I would like to. Um, that is the plan. M initially, when I started high pointing, it was about six years ago, and it was after Guadalupe Peak, and I thought, you know, I can do all of these. And told myself I'd like to do it by the time mm -hmm. I turn 40. Well, that's this year. <laughs> so I have made peace oh, with the cool. fact it's probably not going to happen this year. Um, but I would still like to do all 50 in my lifetime. That's that's my goal. And um, I'll probably just kind of chip away at it a lot slower now. Um, there's a couple years I did some road trips where I knocked out 20 something high points in one summer. Mm -hmm. And so I think those days are over, but um, I absolutely plan to finish it at some point. I just don't have a set time frame now. <laughs> right. Well, you have plenty of time and maybe mm -hmm. you don't want to do them too fast, you know? I mean, I talk to mm -hmm. a lot of people that have a ton of lists. Like after they're done with the state high points, they want to do the county high points and then they want to do the these high points and the that one. Yep. There's so many lists that you can do, but maybe you don't have to rush through the, the 50 high points. But you mentioned in our conversation before we started recording that you have summited 45. Yes, yeah, getting close. So do you high point with your husband as well, or is it just you on your own? It's kind of a combination. Um, he has, I think he's done about eight with me. Um, I've done, mm -hmm. I think probably, I forget exactly how many. My mom has joined me for probably about 20 or 25 of them, actually, which has been a really cool oh, experience cool. to have her along for the ride and uh my sister has done a couple with me my cousins have done a couple so it's kind of I've, I've drawn in some family members of of mm -hmm. a whole bunch of different types of family members which is really neat um but then a lot of them i have done solo and so that's actually been a really cool experience too to to do some of these high points alone and some of the tougher ones alone and just to know that that uh, i'm capable of doing that and so it's it's been fun to have people along. It's been just as rewarding to do some of these solo. Now, can you tell us about some high points that maybe didn't go according to plan? Uh, probably the biggest one that comes to mind would be King's Peak in Utah. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, like I said, that was my fourth one. So still relatively new to high pointing and, and had a decent amount of experience with just hiking, long distance hiking, backpacking. That wasn't new to me, but I ended up getting lost overnight on that trail. And I say on the trail, but really I wasn't on the trail at a certain point. Um, and it was not an intentional <laughs> overnight. Um, and I was not prepared for it. And so um, definitely a learning experience. A lot of things went wrong a lot of things then ultimately went right. Um, uh, it was a, yes, it was definitely the one that did not go according to plan. So were you by yourself on this one? Uh, yes and no. Um, and this, you know, brings up the, the whole hiking solo versus hiking with a group. And um, 
I started mm-hmm. that hike with a group. Uh, my It was my cousins and my uncle. We all were on our way up to the summit and we had uh, camped the night before at Dollar Lake, kind of where a lot of people stop and spend the night before. And uh, we were making our way up to the summit and we had about, I'd say a quarter mile, half a mile, something like that left. And uh, for some personal reasons, they were kind of feeling like, you know what, I don't, we don't think we can make it. We're going to maybe just head on back. And I was kind of torn going, I know I should stick with the group and, but we're so close and they weren't necessarily doing it as a high point. And I was, I was trying to check it off. And so our compromise, which sounded good at the time was, I'm going to run up here because, you know, I can, I can get this done quick. I'm going to run up here, tag the top. I'm going to head back down. I'm going to catch up with you guys. You know, give me half an hour. I'll be right behind you. Um, and sounded good at the time. Um, and that's what the plan was. I still to this day don't really know what happened in between that point of reaching the summit and turning around and going back to find them and catch up with them. I think I took a deer path or or something along the way. And after about an hour, I realized I I'm not on the trail anymore. <laughs> and I think just that environment where you're in that open, rocky, barren you know, expanse below the summit. And it's, it's not as hard to see. I mean, it's not as easy to see the trail than when you're in a forest or something like that. And so it was just kind of one Mm -hmm. of those surreal moments of realizing, A, I haven't caught up to them. Something's wrong. And B, this doesn't even look like a trail anymore. And so in my somewhat inexperienced state, I thought, you know, let me look for some landmarks. Let me kind of figure out how to get back on the trail. Um, And all the different things I tried did not work and ultimately just kept getting further off the trail until I kind of came to a point where I realized after a couple hours, I'm probably going to spend the night out here. Um, I need to come up with some kind of plan. And so I had gotten to a point where I found a stream and I figured I'm going to follow this downstream. That's that's my plan. (laughs) And so I did a lot of bushwhacking uh, for a couple hours and... uh, Eventually, right before sunset, the stream ended up on another trail, which was a really good thing. It was not the trail I was supposed to be on. I had no idea what trail it was, but it was a trail. Mm -hmm. And so I realized, you know, I I can follow this out. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get out. I don't know where it's going to lead. I have no cell service, but I'm on a trail. You know, that's that's the good thing. And ended up finding a good spot to shelter down for the night. And um Woke up the next morning, booked it out of there. Uh, my goal was let me let me try to find human beings before <laughs> my family, who had I had assumed at that point returned to Dollar Lake, had camped the night, probably worried all night because I didn't show up, and I thought they're going to head back out mm-hmm. to the trailhead. I want to beat them out before they call for help. And uh, yeah, I think I think I, I eventually reached civilization i found a couple other hikers at the end of that trailhead it i was in a different national forest i mean i really really just did the opposite of what i should have done coming off that summit and so um they i did not beat my family to making the phone calls so my parents had to get that phone call Mm -hmm. my husband um the search and rescue had already been called out and so luckily um i got to a phone quick enough to be able to let them know I was okay. And they could call everything off before the, the helicopters and all that came in. But, uh, it was a a very eventful night. Um, it just a learning experience. I I learned a lot of what not to do and, uh, how to be a little bit better prepared, but it was also kind of cool to realize like, Hey, I made it through that. Okay. I did a lot of things, right. I actually did know some of the things to do and, and uh, that's, I think, a lot of people's worst case scenarios. And to kind of get through that and just get it out of the way it was like, OK, um, you know, this this isn't going to put me off from hiking anymore. This is a this is a good learning experience and I'm going to take it and and keep going with it. So <laughs> now what was the temperature? Uh, you know, it I think because I went back and looked later, it was 
the high 30s, lower 40s, you know, nothing nothing too terrible, but I did not have real good layers. Um, I had a waterproof layer outside, which was good, but I think I just had a t-shirt on underneath and, you know, I, I had some good things going yeah. for me and then some that were not made for 30s and 40 degrees at night, but um, I, I shivered a lot, yeah. but it wasn't a just... life-threatening situation. <laughs> sure. Did you just sleep on the ground in your clothes? Pretty much. Uh, I found a kind of cluster of really tall pine trees that were kind of surrounded at the base mm -hmm. by a smaller cluster of pine trees. And so I figured, you know, if it rains on me, I've got a good canopy. Um, I've got kind of a little bit of a barrier down here at the bottom in case, you know, there's a bear or something. I really didn't know what to expect. And so... Um, and it did mm -hmm. rain that night. I could see kind of the outline of the mountain range. Um, the lightning would go off and I could see the outline flash. And I was thinking, okay, well, a couple miles mm -hmm. off, it is raining, but it never made it to me. And so that was, you know, definitely a, a blessing that I didn't get rained on at least. And you had water because you were near a stream, you said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had water. I had a filter with me. And so um, I knew at least, you know, I had plenty to drink and okay. I had some snacks. Yeah. So so when you met back up with your family, was everybody really surprised to see you and see you in good shape? Yeah, there were a lot of tears and, you know, they, they had a really well, yeah, I'm bad sure they night the not knowing what had happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah it, it was yeah. a, it was a, uh, a rough night for them and then them having to make the phone calls to all the, you know, the family members saying, you know, Kristen didn't come back last night. It were not fun phone oh. calls for them to make. So um, they were very relieved, but it was yeah. kind of emotional at, at first. Yeah. But you got the high point. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yes. I stubbornly got that high point and uh, it, it took longer than I thought. Right. It would. And <laughs> I'm but, not advocating, you know, get the high point at all costs. It just, it is, you know, after all that, you did some it, so it's funny. Right, right. Yes, don't, don't, uh, don't go against your better judgment to get a high point, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> so did that change the way that you reached other high points or did other hikes following that incident? Um, It made me a lot more aware of kind of, my surroundings and paying better attention sure. to, to like route finding and, and landmarks. And um, I, I definitely take more care to make sure I know where I am going at all times, even if it's kind of a easy hike that I'm familiar with. I'm, I'm a lot more aware than I probably mm -hmm. was before. Um, and I, I'm more prepared or I'd like to think I'm more prepared for, a variety of situations that might arise and, and uh, just kind of mm -hmm. having a more humble respect for the wilderness. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. not thinking, you know, you're invincible, which I don't think I necessarily did, but a, a little dose of even more humility is not a bad thing at times. So I got that. <laughs> what was your favorite high point of the ones you've done so far? Uh, ironically, I, King's Peak is probably still, if not my favorite, still one of my top favorites. I I just think that hike is beautiful. I think that area of Utah is yeah. just stunning. Um, and I think a couple, probably my other favorites, uh, Mount Whitney in California. I loved that hike. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I love everything about that hike. It was challenging, but beautiful. And I love the area around Lone Pine. Um I, I enter that lottery every year, so and I probably will continue to do so. Let's see, a yeah. couple other ones. Uh, Mount Rogers in Virginia. I thought that was a beautiful one. Um, getting to hike kind of on the Appalachian Trail, really just iconic. So those are, those are probably my top mm -hmm. three right there. So when you did the High Point Southeast, did you travel out there for that reason, or were you in the area and decided to hit some High Points? For the East Coast, it was primarily high pointing, and and I did so because they're mm -hmm. they're so close together. Um, as a teacher, yeah. I have the summers off, and so I could basically go out 
east for two weeks and hit 20 high points. Um, and so that's kind of what I did a couple years in a row is just kind of knock out the entire eastern half of the country. Yeah, I talked to a lot of teachers on the podcast with um, a similar situation for their summers, and that's how they get a lot of it done. Mm -hmm. Have you <laughs> met anyone interesting along the way in your high pointing, um, maybe on a trail or at a trailhead or at a summit? No, I, I have. I, I think it's cool that even in the more recent years, I've met more high pointers who are there specifically for high pointing. Um, which I think is cool. I think okay. the word's getting out there. And so I always enjoy just kind of mm -hmm. those those meetups. But I think the the person that stands out to me the most is probably the most interesting story I've met. High pointing was um, a lady when I was doing Mount Rogers in Virginia. Uh, she was, I think at the time she was maybe 65 or 66, and she was section hiking the Appalachian Trail and it had been like her wow. life goal. And uh, she was doing it by herself. Um, this cute little lady mm -hmm. just out on the trail on her own. And she had, I think, about like 100 miles left or something. And it was just really cool to run into her at the end of this like life journey she's been on every year, just chipping away at this goal. And, and just to talk to someone who was wow. like at the end of it was really, really neat and that she wasn't afraid to do it solo and she wasn't afraid to do it in her you know 60s and um, it was just really inspiring she always stuck out to me so how do you train for high pointing uh, you mentioned you're a runner is that what you do that's a big part of it um at this point i'm kind of always mixing a little bit of running and hiking and they both just balance each other out really well um hiking mm -hmm. has benefited my running and running has benefited my hiking. And so it's just kind of a good combination of both. And that's, that's primarily how I train is, is just long runs and long hikes. So when you tell other people in your life that you're high pointing or that you're trying to reach all 50 state high points, what do they say? Uh, usually the first question is just, how do you have time to do that? Um, <laughs> which oh, sure. you know, I'm like, well, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so, but um, mm -hmm. and then they always kind of ask like, what, what made you decide to want to do that? And I guess I'm a checklist minded type of person. And so that appeals mm -hmm. to me that it's, it's a checklist. Um, I think it's important to not just look at it strictly as a checklist and to enjoy it too. But as far as kind of like figuring out where I want to go on vacation, I already know. There, I have 50 choices. I just have to pick one. Yeah. And so like the, some people kind of get overwhelmed, you know, oh, where, where should I go on the trip, you know, for, you know, I'm like, oh, well, I already know because it's it's all kind of planned out. And right. so um, it, it appeals to me. It makes sense in my mind. And so I know some mm -hmm. people are kind of like, you know, that that's crazy. But, um, you know, I've I've. I've gotten to see all 50 states now. I haven't hiked all of them yet, but a large part of that was just high pointing mm -hmm. road trips and um, just getting to see all these cool little corners of the country and meet other high pointers. And um, I just think it's a really unique way to travel and not just to hike and not just to kind of achieve your goals, but just, just to travel um, and, and just see the country more. Mm -hmm. And it takes you to some places you'd never go to otherwise. And and uh, so it's just a really, really neat hobby. You're right. And I haven't heard that on the podcast yet for someone to say, I already know my next trip. Um, <laughs> and I've found that high pointers, we love lists and we love maps. So yes, you know, yeah. even if someone has done all 50, they know what they're going to do next. It might not be a fifty, another 50 state high point endeavor, but there's another list that they're going to do. And mm -hmm. I am the same way, and I didn't even realize it. Like, where to go, it's never a question in my mind. It's always like, what season is it, and what <laughs> peaks can I do in that exactly. season? You know, like, which region is, is going to fit this time off or this chunk of time? Um, that's a really good point. I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly how um, my mind works, too. <laughs> so are you a member of the High Pointers Club? Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. So did you join the High Pointers Club 
once you did Guadalupe Peak and you realized, okay, I'm going to do the other states? Or was it something like, oh, I've gathered a lot of high points, I should probably join the club? I I don't remember exactly, but it was fairly early on. Um, mm -hmm. And I think my primary reason initially was I, I wanted to get some advice on some of these, you know, these uh, harder peaks, since that was a good way to get some tips and kind of know what to expect. But um, yeah, as the years have gone on, it's just, it's a really fun community to be a part of because, you know, whether you're on high point number five or number 45 or whatever, like everyone is excited for everybody's goals and um, just really supportive mm -hmm. no matter where you're at. And just the excitement you can kind of sense when people share a picture or when they, you know, bring their kids on a high point and it's just, it's just such a fun supportive community. And so um, it's been great to be a part of that group. I agree. It's a very fun group of people and they're very enthusiastic and mm -hmm. they love cheering you on and they give great trip reports. You know, when you ask yes. someone, what's the best season to do this? They will have story after story after story. And there's never, a dull moment I, I found between high pointers. Like we never run out of things to talk about. Well, that's because I have a podcast, but <laughs> you would imagine if I met them outside of this setting. <laughs> yes, that is true. They, um, we, we love to talk to each other. <laughs> so what high points do you have left? I have Hawaii, Washington, Montana, Wyoming, and Alaska. Okay, so which one do you want to be your last? I'm sure it would be Alaska, if if I had to guess. Um, that's well. Some people say Hawaii because they just want to, you know, reach number fifty and then chill on a beach. Exactly. That that sounds nice. Um, I I guess as my husband would laugh because I'm not really a chill on the beach kind of person. That's part of my problem is, you know, I, I finish a hike and I'm like, what's, what's next? What can we do tomorrow? That's, you know, yeah, really grueling. And, you know, so, um, that, that makes sense, but it probably wouldn't be how I would plan out the end. I, I think for me, I'm like, I want to go out with the, the toughest, hardest hike possible and let that be the last one. Just go yeah. out with the, a bang. And so I, that and the fact that I'll have to save up a lot of money to do Alaska. And yeah, so I'm that sure too. that will be the yeah. last one for some of those practical purposes too. For sure. Yep. And you know, a lot of people save it for last because sometimes they have to wait until they retire to get all that time off. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so after you reach 50 high points, what's another list that you want to do? <laughs> um, there is a group out there that um, attempts to run a marathon in all 50 states. So I've already looked into oh, that. Yeah. Okay. So that, yep. that might be, that might be a next list. Um, I've already met a couple people uh, recently doing some other races who are trying to do a half marathon each of the 50 states. And so, um, you know, mm -hmm. it could go either way, but probably running a race in all 50 states would be my next goal, which I haven't started on. So it would be a, a big goal. <laughs> How has high pointing and the outdoors in general enriched your life? Um, I just think that ability to, to have a goal and to achieve it. Um, I, I That's kind of what clicks for me is having a personal goal. And I think that's why I've enjoyed some of these really tougher, longer, you know, high point hikes. Um, it, it's just that sense of personal accomplishment. So for me, that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of how it's enriched my life is just, um, number like number 45 for me was Mount Whitney. And I did that one solo and it was just kind of this, like, I got a little teary at the top because it was this culmination of like, I just hiked this by myself. This is, you know, a really tough, hard thing to do. And, just that sense of personal accomplishment was um, kind of a personal high point for me. And, um, and I think just some secondary goals as far as like, I, I got to see all the different states and gotten to share 
hiking, which is something I love, being able to share that with my mom and my sister and my husband. Those are all secondary goals, which, you know, make mm-hmm. the experience that much more meaningful too. What are some of your favorite outdoor adventure movies, books, mm-hmm. podcasts, or documentaries that you've seen that you would recommend to listeners? There's there's one that comes to mind and it's it's a little morbid and not everybody gets it, but I think it's fascinating. Uh, there's a book called Death in the Grand Canyon, and it's okay. basically a list of all known fatalities in the Grand Canyon. And I I don't know why I find that so fascinating, but I think maybe it's it's not it's not the personal accounts themselves, but it's kind of just like that reminder of, again, just this humble respect for, for your surroundings in the wilderness. And um, the Grand Canyon itself is, is probably one of my favorite places in the world. And I, I love it there. And I hiked a lot there and it's just kind of this different perspective on this really photographed popular place that you go and you think, there's millions of people here. What could go wrong? And and I don't know, that book just kind of hit a chord with me of this is why you respect where you're hiking. This is where, why you, you know, have some humility when you're in the wilderness and the outdoors. And so um, I don't, that mm-hmm. book just fascinates me in a weird way, but um, uh, any, mm-hmm. anything related to the Appalachian trail, I, you know, I really enjoy um, those types of books and documentaries and I've watched a couple and read a couple. Um, I think, Hiking Through was one of my favorites. Um, I read a book or listened to a book recently. I think it was Biking Across America. I'm trying to remember the exact title, but it's a story of a a man who was a a recent uh, widower, and he decided to bike across the United States. And so um, just kind of hearing someone's personal account of Mm. a massive goal like that and accomplishing it and kind of what happened along that journey. Um, you know, those are all just, just, uh, some of my favorites, I guess. Yeah, I agree. And regarding the book about the fatalities in the Grand Canyon, I also enjoy, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but I do appreciate people putting those stories out because before I climbed Rainier, I did read a book about accident reports within the national Mm -hmm. park. And a lot of the deaths in Mount Rainier National Park are not all climbers. You know, a lot of people Mm -hmm. fall in a river and get swept away or they get lost and it's too cold. And I've read the same uh, reports about Yosemite National Park, um, how people Mm -hmm. die or like what, what circumstances they find themselves in where they get into a lot of trouble. And I, I don't read it. I guess is like a sensational thing, but it's more of a, they're just like you and I, they just Mm -hmm. go on a hike because they, they're in a beautiful place. And then nature just, you know, has another plan and it could be any of us. And so that's why I think it's, it's good to know about that. Those things are possible. They can happen. And yeah. those resources are out there. The stories are out there. And uh, it's always good to know those things before you go into a park. Of course, the book I read about Rainier, there were a lot of climbers that died. And, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of them, it was weather related or a crevasse or something like that. But then there are a lot of like car accidents, just people right. driving you know, they're not prepared for the winter conditions when they're driving through the park. And there's just a lot of motor vehicle accidents. And so it's these things that you don't expect that that can happen anywhere at any time, Mm -hmm. even when we're just like on our way to do these high points or any kind of hike or outdoor endeavor. So I'm fascinated by those things too. And it's also just like one of those good to know kind of uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps prepare you in a certain sense. (laughs) Yeah. Just curious, did you read that before King's Peak or after? Uh, After. And the funny thing is, my cousin is the one who gave it to me, the one that I got lost with. So she has an odd sense of humor, too. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Well, Kristen, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming on the show. And I wish you the best of luck in your next uh, five high points and would love to hear an update on, on how those go. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me on. And and this was a, a lot of fun and I'd love to hopefully someday give you an update on those last five. <laughs> <laughs>